and welcome back to Big Mouth and welcome to the Big Mouth Daily. Remember, you can tag, speak to me and follow me over on Twitter at Movies TV Mad. It's pinch of salt time, everybody, because one of my sources has told me, and this is an exclusive if this is true, and you never know with sources, but Henry Cavill, apparently, according to my source, will be in the Flashpoint movie. Now, most of the Justice League characters we saw in Zack Snyder's Justice League, Snyder Cut, and in Justice League will be in the beginning of the Flashpoint movie. I don't know about Ray Fisher. I am told things are looking a lot more positive for Ray Fisher than they were a few months ago, but I don't know. I hope Ray, Ray Cyborg will be involved. So what's the kind of information I have here? That, that Henry Cavill not only will be in Flashpoint, but will be having cameos in quite a few DCEU movies. DCEU movies, you may be thought he wouldn't be involved in. So Henry Cavill has a big future within the DCEU. They know he's loved. They know he is popular. At this moment in time, I have no information on another Man of Steel movie, or whether he can kind of balance over on the Snyderverse and do stuff centrally. We don't know if they're going to restore the Snyderverse yet, so it's not really worth talking about that at this time. But for sure, Henry Cavill, I've been told, will be in the Flashpoint movie. Now, if you follow me and you follow my channel, I've always been kind of really confident about that. I just felt that the Justice League characters not including Cyborg, by the way, because of everything that's gone on between Hamada and Fisher. But in terms of the other characters, they were always going to play a role in this movie because I always felt that the Justice League, including Ezra Miller's The Flash, would be fighting someone, maybe Reverse Flash, at the beginning of this movie. So this, that is what I'm hearing at this moment in time. Now, questions like, what costume will he be wearing? I Listen, it's quite simple. They've made it pretty clear that the Snyder Cut isn't canon. I do not expect Henry Cavill to wear the black costume he ended up wearing at the end of Zack Snyder's Justice League Snyder Cut. So expect him in his traditional costume. It may even be a refurbished costume. It may, it may even be a newer costume. But we did see Andrew Machete holding up the Man of Steel costume for Supergirl. Now, a lot of people are saying, well, that's the only costume he has right now. He was just holding it up. I think it would be awesome if they stuck with the original logo and the original costume. But who knows? Anything's possible. I think Superman can change costumes quite easily. You know, he could have grabbed one from one of those ships or whatever you could, whatever you call it, right? So, uh, but I would imagine they'll stick with the Man of Steel costume. I do expect Supergirl to have the same one. Now, again, we don't know what Earth Supergirl is from when we see her in this Flashpoint movie, if she's from the new universe and she comes back with Ezra Miller's The Flash, or she's already been in the DCEU all this time. That's an interesting one, because we have discussed before about Zack Snyder's Man of Steel prequel comic, and in that comic, she's got blonde hair. Now, I expect her to keep her own hair colour. I expect, uh, I, I expect Sasha Calais to keep her original looks and her hair colour. I don't expect them to make her blonde. They may make her blonde, but I doubt it. I know that um, Amy Adams dyed her hair red for a um, Man of Steel and BVS and even Justice League. I don't expect that to be the same situation here. And I do expect Henry Cav Cav Cavill and Sasha, Sasha Calais to have um, screen time together as well. That's if she's actually from Earth One, which is the DCEU we've been watching thus far. So more, more questions than answers at this point, but that's what I can tell you, tell you thus far. That what I'm telling, what I've, I've been told from some really reliable people, and I'm not talking about the kind of people you see talking shit with articles and on Twitter, I'm talking about really good people that I've trusted before. I mean, these are the people who told me that Keaton was going to be in Flashpoint. So really reliable sources. But again, 
Who knows? We'll talk about Keaton and Flashpoint um, very shortly because there have been doubts about Michael's involvement. Now, look, Walter Hamada and Andrew Machete have done well to even approach him in the first place. You know, who doesn't want to see Michael Keaton's 1989-1992 uh, um, Batman, you know, be part of the DCEU? Come on. An older Batman. Now, there are rumours that his original 89 um, Batmobile has been seen. I don't know where, but it has been seen. Uh, so that's good news. And apparently, I'm um, exclusive from Grace Randolph. He is in this. Now, Michael did put um, some doubt over this because um, he said if the script's no good, if, you know, because of COVID, he might not do it. I think there was, you've got to understand Keaton's humour as well. I think he's in. I think he's doing it. I think the rumours about Bale were bullshit unless Bale's involved as well. Listen. We've discussed Flashpoint as well as well so many times, haven't we? And I've told you what's happening where everything that's ever been done live action will probably be canon in this film, including a Nicolas Cage Superman, Brandon Ralph Superman. Even if we don't see them a lot, we will see little flashes of them, which is really, really exciting because this basically says they can do anything. They can do multiverse movies, right? They can do Brandon Ralph Superman movies, he can join Earth One. They could do so many things because I think they are leading towards, and I've actually been thinking this for a very long time, and this excites me a great deal, a DCEU version of Crisis on Infinite Earth. So the one we saw in Arrowverse was a mini one, but if they do it in the DCEU like I think they will, but I think, I think this is the arc they're heading towards or something along those lines. Which means all these characters, including the Arrowverse and other live action versions, Ryan Reynolds, Green Lantern, could be in Flashpoint as well. I'm not saying he is, but I think they're trying to get as many people that we've seen in live action before. So this Flashpoint movie is huge. Um, I believe a lot of people's criticism is, oh, they don't have faith in Ezra Miller as the Flash. This is why they're doing this. No, 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 no. This is not about... Ezra's ability. Ezra is one of the great actors of this generation. I've, I've, I've marveled at his performance in both Fantastic Beast movies. He's fantastic. In fact, he's one of the strongest elements of both of those films, by the way, whether you like them or not. Ezra is a really good actor. There's no question about faith or lack of faith in Ezra. This is, this is a kind of a course correction. I'm not saying the course needed to be corrected, but they think it does need correcting. So Ezra Miller and his character, basically Barry Allen and The Flash, are front and centre in the movie. These other cameos and other people like Keaton you're going to see, they don't take centre stage. Now Keaton will figure, from what I hear and what we hear thus far, will figure quite a lot in the new universe, which is kind of a twisted version, I suppose, of the 89 Earth, or could it be that he's just kind of, things have reset themselves in this new universe that Barry's created from going back in time to save his mother's life, from being murdered by Reverse Flash, you have by form. It could be something like that. But going back to Cavill, this was always a very important element, that if we're going to see the entire Justice League, we need to see Cavill. And it's not just about that. We've been desperate to see Cavill since 2017's Justice League. I don't think his appearance in that film is all bad. The race, the Superman Flash race, which we saw the beginning of, is an awesome thing, by the way. I know a lot of people say, it's crap, it's crap. I don't think it is crap. It's an iconic comic book moment that everyone has been desperate to see. They kind of did it with Supergirl and The Flash, with um, Melissa Benoist's Supergirl and Grant Gustin's The Flash, where they had a race, didn't they, in Arrowverse, which was really cool. But you want to see Superman. And Barry Allen's The Flash, you know, having screen time. And so if this is true, and I've always believed this was going to happen anyway, so I do believe my source. Sometimes I'll tell you I'm not sure about this source. I'm not sure. No disrespect to them. But they understand that people are, are going to warn their subscribers and their viewers and anyone who comes in um, into their videos. Now, if you're floating about, smash subscribe, smash like. This channel has been going for a couple of years not a very successful channel, I'll be honest. I'm, I'm nobody special. I just love my geek. And I'm, Superman is my number one character. But my fandom goes beyond DC. I, I love the MCU. I used to stand shows like X-Files and Quantum Leap. 
And now we've changed the name to the show to the Big Mouth Daily. We can talk about all of those things. So if there's a TV show from years gone by or one that's going on right now, we can discuss it. And if I don't know that show, you can give me some information and I can read up. I can do anything you want. Now it's the Big Mouth Daily. But obviously DC and my geek is my number one priority. But we want to talk about other things as well, of course. But the fandom, everyone loves Henry Cavill's Man of Steel. Whether you like Snyder's iteration of, of, the, of, this, of his DC universe or not, everyone's been desperate to see Cavill return. So if this is the truth, it would be, look, uh, there'll be no one, well, I'm sure, look, I'm not going to say there'll be no one happier than me. That'd be really arrogant, wouldn't it? But just to see Henry Cavill and the rest of the Justice League in Andrew Machete's Flashpoint movie, um, I still don't know if it's going to be called Flashpoint, by the way. It could just be called The Flash. I don't know. But the Flashpoint story is being integrated. To be clear, it's not a copy and pasting. They're using the Flashpoint story to reboot the DCEU. Um, not totally, and as Andy's already said, nothing's going to be forgotten, but we are looking at the reshaping of the DC Extended Universe. I have no idea what they're going to burn and what they're going to keep. I don't know if it's true that they're going to burn elements of the Snyderverse. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say they're not, because we know that they just don't see Zack's vision, they don't get it, they don't believe it's what the mainstream audience wants, which is obviously problematic for people like you and me who love the Snyderverse. This is the problem with the Snyderverse. If you love it, you love it. But if you don't like it, you don't like it. And I think it's as Ann Sarnoff says, we want to do something for all audiences. Now, I hope that's for the Snyderverse fandom as well. And we can integrate these DC castings by Snyder and what he's done already into this central universe. Not necessarily in a huge way, but when you hear things like rumours like Henry Cavill's going to be in Flashpoint, this this is good. These are good things. I can't see any, anything negative from what Hamada is setting up here and Machete, by the way, who I think Machete will be the lead creative. Um, I mentioned this in, in yesterday's Big Mouth Daily. I think Machete will be the one, if there are future Justice League movies, he will do those Justice League movies. I think maybe he may get he may get a Henry Cavill Superman movie. That'd be interesting to see how he handles this. So this is a Flash movie. This does focus on Ezra Miller's Barry Allen and The Flash. But it's also a kind of strategy that Fags had from the very forgive, forgiving, the beginning. Let's start again. Um, this has been a strategy that Kevin Fakes had from the very beginning over at the MCU. A little bit later on, we will be kind of reacting to um, Falcon and the Winter Soldier, episode five. So do hang around for that as well. So this is the strategy they're going for. Listen, it's not about being unoriginal and copying the MCU, right? Let's not forget the Green Lantern movie had a post credit scene and a pretty awesome one at that. So... Um, you know, it's not like, and you know, Masters of the Universe in 87 starring Dolph Lundgren. We had Frank Langella as, um, as Skeletor in the water. I'll be back. So it's not like no one's ever done this, but no one's done what Fake's done before. A continuing franchise with post credit scenes. It's an exciting thing. And cameos. So no stand, no character movie is totally all about that character. We saw Captain America and the Winter Soldier. We saw Black Widow in that movie. We saw Nick Fury in that movie, but it was still Chris Evans, Steve Rogers movie. They didn't interrupt that. So there's clever ways of putting other characters and other heroes in these movies, but they don't take away from these characters. By the way, Black Widow had a big role in Captain America and the Winter Soldier, but it didn't ruin Captain America's character. Can anyone come out and tell me that Captain America and the Winter Soldier wasn't about Steve Rogers and Captain America? and his relationship with his friend Bucky, and the devastating reveal that he was the Winter Soldier. No, there was no issue. So you can do these cameos. Everyone's saying, all these characters, but, you know, it's fine. But if you don't want it to be fine, and you want to come up with a reason why you think this sucks, you're going to say it sucks. I want to restore the Snyderverse, but it doesn't mean I want to tear down something that seems very terrific to me. And very exciting. Ever since I heard about this multiverse, uh, multi, multiverse strategy idea, I was very, very excited. 
And I think if you're a DC fan who's been reading these characters or watching these characters in live action all your lives, no matter if you're 12, 20, 25, or 48 like me, uh, but, uh, you know, these are exciting things. If you're a true geek, these are exciting things. You know, yesterday we we had another Release the Air Cut um, event over on Twitter. I was a part of that. I supported that. I retweeted loads of those posts, and I, and I you know, I, I did the hashtag myself. And I'm going to look for you um, later on as well, because there's a picture that David Air posted on Instagram while this was going on. So Snyder and Air are all for the, the restoration of the Snyderverse and the release of the air cut. And so am I. You, you know, I'm fed up of this Ivor Raw generation. You either love Man of Steel or you love Superman the movie. Can't I fucking love both? Can I love Christopher Reeve and Henry Cavill? Of course I can, because they're both iconic versions of Superman. And by the way, I love Tom Welling's character. What I love about Tom Welling's Smallville character, and we, now we're called the Big Mouth Daily, we can talk about Smallville a lot more as well. I think what's great about Tom Welling's Clark Kent is that it's a different kind of, um, I suppose it's um, it's a pure Superman. It's a, shall I say, a pre-Superman story, isn't it? So it's before he becomes Superman, but he's a valid version of Clark Kent. He's a valid version of that character. This Ivor Orr, um, you know, this generation, this Ivor Orr generation is really starting to grind my gears, as, as Peter Griffin would say. Um, love Family Guy and love The Simpsons as well, by the way. Maybe we'll talk about them here on the Big Mouth Daily as well, because I do love these animated sitcoms. I would love to talk about those shows one day and say what a revolution it's been to take sitcoms into animation and how magical and amazing it's been. And you can kind of get away with a lot more with animation, can't you? But great shows, and I binge them all the time. And so that's the news we're hearing right now here on Big Mouth, that Henry Cavill will play a role in Andrew Machete's Flashpoint. Now, don't expect an announcement anytime soon. Why? Oh, you would say that, Mick. No, I'm not saying it to cover myself. I'm telling you, their Warner Brothers pictures like to pick their announcements wisely, as we've seen in the past. This is a huge announcement. I still think as exciting as this is, it's a polarizing announcement, because there will be some members of the Snyderverse, a verse that I adore, as you already know, that will be very upset about this, that they will see this, that this maybe strikes a blow to the restoration of the Snyderverse. I don't believe that's true. We have to keep on fighting. I can't tell you. I've been more confident than I am right now about it being restored. But I will say this. Just keep on hashtagging. Keep on fighting. Coming up with events. You know, this weekend we've got Justice Con kicked off yesterday. A great event for charity. That's for us Snyderverse fans. That's something that's never going to go away. We're going to have that every year. And it's brilliant. And um, just, you know, Wonder Meg and her, her gang. Is it Wonder Meg? I can't remember now. But her gang do a great job. Trusted and loved by Zach. And, you know, Harry J. Lennox is, is involved as well. And a few other people from Zack Snyder's um, Justice League universe as well. So that's very exciting. I'm not here on this channel to be anti-Snyder because, you know, I love Snyder's DC movies. I'm not here to be anti-Central Universe. I'm here to say, take two syringes and inject it in my fucking veins, baby, because this is really, really exciting. Now, let me know down at the bottom if you're excited about this, constructively or not. Give me your reasons why you're excited for the Central Universe and give me your reasons why you're not. Don't just say to me, it's shit, it's crap, it's not going to work. If you think the Hamada plan won't work, Give me intelligent, constructive reasons why. Look at that, everyone. This is what Sir David Eyre, and I've just knighted the guy. Sir David Eyre posted this from his original Suicide Squad. This is from the air cut of what he shot that wasn't in the theatrical release. And I think it looks amazing. I'm, I can't really make out who's who. Should we have a look? So if I zoom in here, so you can yeah, you can kind of make out the characters, can't you? You've got Captain Boomerang, Harley Quinn. And I think that's, is that Will Smith? Yes, yeah, so it's really awesome. It's part of the third act, that picture. And I, I, I really think that was great of David Eyre to do that. 
uh, to post that. It, he, he wants the trends. He clearly wants the, the tag to trend. So he's trying to help it. And it's great that he's really interested in that. He wants us to see his version. Um, unfortunately for David, he's never going to be able to work on another Suicide Squad film again. Uh, yesterday, on yesterday's show, I told you that I've, I've seen a test screening of James Gunn's The Suicide Squad. It's a pretty tremendous movie, and he's going to be in charge of this whole universe now, um, which I'm happy about, but it's bittersweet because I think David Ayer did make a good movie that we do um, need to see. Now, Kathy Yan got some credit from someone or won an award for the costumes of Birds of Prey and the Fantabulous Emancipation of one Harley Quinn. She said, we wanted to take the girls, we wanted to take women superheroes out of the cat suits. This really triggered me. And I was about to quote tweet her, but I thought, Mick, no, not worth it. Let's not show them that we're toxic. So I, I, I subtweeted, and I can't remember where the tweet is and I can't find it now for you, but this is my opinion. Kathy, I'm talking to you directly, even though I'm a low-life YouTuber who you're never going to watch. Kathy, you have no love. You people have no love for comic books, do you? And when I say you people, you people who have got this warped agenda, not once has any of the birds of prey worn any cat suits. And if you bothered to read a comic, you would see that the birds of prey, including Harley, wear beautiful, wonderful, aesthetically pleasing costumes, right? But you don't care about comic book accuracy. You want to take the women out of the cat suits. We're good for you. Now, let me say this about your movie, Kathy. I think it's okay. I think it's solid. I think your commentary is absolutely toxic. And that's why your film failed at the box office. You're not going to get to do another DC movie. But one of your castings, we know, um, Journey Smollett, who's amazing, will probably play Black Canary again. And I'm happy for that because she's a positive individual. And positive, talented individuals deserve to thrive in this industry. Now let's talk about episode five of Falcon and the Winter Soldier. There's a little bit to unpackage here. Now, I think in the centre of this episode, we do divulge into filler territory, but I still like it. So let's start with the awesome beginning of this episode. So we pretty much continue from where we left off. We've got the new Captain America, John. I can't remember his real name now. But anyway, I think it's John, right? He's just killed the guy with his shield. There's blood all over it. He runs into this warehouse. I think it's a warehouse anyway. And um, Sam Wilson and Bucky catch up with him. They want the shield. He refuses to give it. They have a kind of a similar fight to what they do in um, Captain America Civil War um, when Bucky and Cap are fighting Tony Stark, a.k.a. Iron Man. So, but it's a brilliant fight. It really is the struggle for the shield, the passion for the shield. Both sides want it. It's amazing. It's such an amazing fight. And obviously the Falcon's wings are broken by John as well in this fight sequence. So it's a brilliant scene. And I, I really kind of started to tear up when, when Sam was wiping the blood off the shield. The energy here is all about Steve, Steve Rogers' wish for Sam Wilson to be the next Captain America. Now, I'm going to say this again, although I like the actor who plays Sam, forgot his name as well now, but um, in the comics, Sam Wilson does become Captain America, I think. I, I think I've got that right. Someone down in the comments below can correct me if I'm wrong. And I don't have no issue with this. And as much as I do like the actor as an actor who plays Sam Wilson, he doesn't have the stature or the screen presence to be an awesome Captain America. Now, once that happens, if it happens, and it's looking like from what we saw in episode five of Falcon and the Winter Soldier, it will happen. Um, maybe he can prove me wrong. But thus far, I just don't see how he can be a good Captain America. And they've really tried to kind of develop his character because in the movies Sam Wilson's aka the Falcon's character has been very very underdeveloped and that's been problematic for me and many many people when he was given the shield at the end of Endgame but let's be absolutely clear here he was given the shield at the end of Endgame Caps wanted him to have it we knew from that moment he would be the next Captain America and I'm staggered that Fag wanted to drag this thing out through a limited series. I really am. But it's been interesting. I've enjoyed the show. 
Um, we've got the finale next week. Only six episodes. I'm surprised by that, but it is a bit of a short series, but we've got so many more um, Marvel Studios, um, Disney Plus streaming shows to go, and I'm really excited, and we've got some great movies. It's a big year. Uh, for the MCU, and if you're a fan of that franchise, which I am, by the way, but mainly I'm a DC stan, just to be clear, and you will find receipts um, from me slaughtering the MCU in the past, and we've gone through that already, so no point looking for those receipts, they're there. And so we get that brilliant fight, but then Bucky and Sam go their own way, and um, Sam goes to his sister, Sarah, who I love, by the way, love the flirting with Bucky and Sarah as well, could they be an item? I think that would be pretty cool. But this gets very lethal weapon kind of bantery territory when Sam tells Bucky, stop flirting with my sister. And I kind of like that. I think they may get together. It may just be an in-house joke we see now and again when we see these characters together. So basically, nobody wants to buy this boat because they've decided to sell the boat. So they call in some favours from this town. They get all these geriatrics. Yes, geriatrics. Mainly... And they uh, fix up this boat. And it's a great little sequence. But you do feel that they purposely slowed down the pace. Because they didn't want to go any further. Because we've got all the great stuff in the finale. And in penultimate episodes. It's interesting. Sometimes penultimate episodes of TV series can be really ex as exciting as the finales. And sometimes they can slow the pace down. As episode 5 of Falcon and the Winter Soldier ultimately did. And so, I'm going to read an article about it, actually, because there's um, there's one about, what's the character's name? I'm crap with names, right? Yeah, we've got one about Danny Ramirez, which is interesting. So we're going to talk about Danny Ramirez very shortly, because that was an interesting moment as well. So then we get this, he goes to, um, Sam goes to see Isaiah, um, who's played by the magnificent Cole Lumley, who was in one of my favourite shows of all time, Alias. I didn't realise it was Cole, actually, playing is it Isaiah? I can't say his name properly. Anyway, so basically Sam's gone there kind of in mind to give him the shield. I don't know if he's giving him the shield, just to say he's got the shield because it's his by rights, or because he wants him to be the next Captain America, but he can't, not he, at his age. But I was thinking about this. What if Isaiah actually takes the, the juice, the Captain America juice, or whatever you call it, right? Wouldn't that young him up a little bit? Wouldn't that make... Because I don't think Cole Lumley is that old. He's, and you can tell the makeup's trying to put on some... Are they burns or are they wrinkles? I don't know. But I think maybe Cole Lumley could be the next Captain America. At this moment, it's Sam Wilson, um, which is what we knew from the end, as I've said, from the end of Endgame. So this is, doesn't come to as any surprise. And the debates about this whole thing on the internet, should a black man have... Um, become Captain America, they even talk about it in yesterday's episode, isn't an issue for me. You just need someone who has the height, the breadth, the, the, the on-screen stature to play this character. And I don't believe the guy who plays Sam Wilson has, but again, maybe he'll prove me wrong. And so this whole thing starts, and it's quite a good scene, you know, because because um, Isaiah says something along these lines. He says, I, they'll never give the shield to a black man. And if they do, he says, which black man in their right mind would take it? So this puts Sam in a really awkward situation. And so ultimately, he does kind of decide he wants it. So we get this great training montage where he's chucking the shield about. It's a really awesome scene. He drops it. He catches it. It's really good. He wants to be Captain America now. He didn't at the beginning of this series, and now he does. Maybe he doesn't really want to become Captain America. Maybe he's just doing it because Steve wanted him to become um, Captain America. And that might be the out of the storytellers here and Kevin Feige, why he might not be. I still can't see any other scenario and then a black man becoming Captain America. And again, it doesn't really matter. That statement is a good statement because of what's happened in America and what's happened within this story. To Isaiah, I don't have an issue with that personally. I know some people will have an issue with that. And so we saw some interesting elements to this episode that put this kind of strand together. And I just want to talk about the post credit scene before I um, read the article from comicbook.com about yesterday's episode. And um, the post credit scene is great. I think it's one of the highlights of the episode where we see John, the former Captain America, forming his own shield and putting his friend's badge on the shield. Or is it his badge? I think it's his friend's badge. And so 
It's going to be a really awesome final battle. And we've got them. We've got Carly and the Flag Smashers. They're stopping this big vote to kind of get rid of all, all, all these refugees and put them back in their so-called own countries. So we saw that play out and the room went dark and that was awesome. So now let's have a look at this. Falcon and the Winter Soldier showrunner says, Marvel execs love Danny Ramirez's future as Torres. By Adam Barnard from comicbook.com. It looks like Joaquin... No, sorry, wrong one. Or is it? Yeah, sorry. It looks like Joaquin Torres, Danny Ramirez, may be here to stay when it comes to the future of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. In fact, the Falcon and the Winter Soldier writer Malcolm Spellman thinks the actor is on the verge of blowing up. Thanks to his upcoming schedule, in addition to playing Torres within the MCU, Ramirez has a starring role in Top Gun Maverick. Well, that's good to hear. According to Spellman, Ramirez's major Hollywood success is inevitable. He's going to blow up, Spellman said. The writer told THR during the, a profile of the actor. It's not because he's doing big stuff. It's because everybody, everybody, Marvel execs, creative filmmakers like me and fans are all having the exact same reaction. He's one of those people who feels inevitable. And that's true. He has got this likability about him from what we've seen in Falcon and the Winter Soldier of him. So I do agree with that. Naturally, Spellman, nor Falcon, and the Winter Soldier director, Carl Scogland, could speak to the actor's exact future in the Disney-owned franchise. Even then, both of the filmmakers are sold on the actor's work, ethic, and his newfound celebrity. I think even as a person, he was a little bit fanning out with the Anthony and the, 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 that's funny, Anthony and Sebastian uh, Stan of it. Scogland told the trade he legitimately was pinching himself that he was part of the project that came through. With Sam Wilson, Anthony Mackie, that's his name, well on the way to becoming Captain America, it's increasingly likely Torres will fill the role of Falcon, a move uh, similar to Marvel Comics. Sam Wilson's Captain America run, though, Let's say that again. So, yes, I've always kind of thought that um, Sam is Captain America eventually in the comics. So let's read that again. It's increasingly likely. So Torres will fill the role of Falcon, a move similar to Marvel Comics. Sam Wilson, Captain America run. Yes. So in the comics, there is a Sam Wilson, Captain America run. I'm not sure how long that lasted. Did it last too long? We'll soon find out. To the Marvel Comics, Sam Wilson, Captain America run. Though Ramirez is 28, Torres has popped up in recent Champions titles, potentially signalling the character's role as a young Avenger in the MCU. If not, the main Avengers team will get back together before too long, and, and with Wilson as the new Cap, the Falcon Mantle will need a suitor. I do think they are doing a young Avengers as well as a main Avengers, which is a very exciting, intelligent thing to do, because then you've got two sets of Avengers, and then once they form together. It's a bit like, I suppose, having the Young Justice team with the real Justice League. That would be so awesome as well if they do that in live action. Who knows? Ramirez concluded his profile by adding, if it gets to this privileged, privileged place, I better know what positive impact I want to make. With just one episode left in The Falcon and the Winter Soldier, what's been your most favourite moment yet? So that's the article. And so, as we can see there, um, Sam Wilson is Captain America in the comic book run. There is a Sam Wilson Captain America comic book run. I don't know the comic so well. I might actually have to Google how long he's Captain America for, because ultimately there's loads of different Captain Americas, but it always goes back to um, Steve. Now, there was a kind of moment between, was it Steve and Bucky? Sorry, say that again. Bucky and Sam, where Sam says... Steve has gone. Now, we saw Steve on the bench as old man Steve, old man Cap, whatever you want to call him. So he wasn't dead. So Sam's saying he's gone. Didn't say he's dead, he's gone. I don't think he's dead. I think he's around somewhere. Maybe he's now working with the team, that are the, the, the Fantastic Four team. Who knows? You know, maybe he'll, he'll play old man Cap in that movie or something. Who knows? This is the MCU. They move around these characters so well in different movies with different characters, so it's awesome. But I do think, whether it's in next week's finale, we will see the fabulous Chris Evans as Steve Rogers. Not once again, we're going to see him loads more times because old man Steve is part of the comic run as well. So very, very interesting there, and I can't wait 
for next week's finale. Quickly reverting back to the DCEU because it's the first, it's the thing that motivated me to start this channel in the first place. Exciting news from Deadline. The Flash movie has begun shooting. I'm sorry anyone who didn't want this to happen and was saying it wasn't going to happen. It's happening. So very, very exciting. They're shooting in London um, at the moment. I don't know where else they're going to shoot. I think London will be the main place. Um, now, Michael Keaton, as I, I said earlier, did have concerns about London. But London, because I'm from the UK, but I live here in Cyprus, which is a little island in the Mediterranean. Mediterranean, but I was born and bred in the UK and I have relatives and friends over in the UK. Their infection levels, if Michael Keaton's watching, the infection levels, Michael, really low. I'm sure you've had your vaccine. You're more than safe over there if you're all following your protocols, which I know these, these studios absolutely are. So Andy Machete and his sister producing and is directing this. I'm very excited for this movie. We've all wanted a Flashpoint movie of sorts. All of our lives. This is exciting, everyone. We've had so many ups and downs with this franchise. And this is fantastic news. I can't wait to start seeing on-set pictures and, you know, a little TV spot and trailers in a few months. Well, not quite a few months' time. It normally takes three to six months to shoot a movie. These days, with so much post-production being done, um, I think you're probably going to get this movie being shot for three or four months. Then they'll go into post, which is, again, really exciting. So I do expect Michael Keaton to be involved. Um, I do expect um, Ben Affleck to be involved. That We've already been told these things, but it goes beyond that. This is Ezra Miller's The Flash, a film the young man fought for himself because at some stages it looked like this stuff wasn't happening. And it's only really, and a lot of people have some negative things to say about Walter Hamada, but I think when... When, when, when the president of DC Films has brought in nearly $3 billion for the company in DC movies he's been involved with, I think we can say he's doing a pretty good job. So the Flashpoint movie, the Flash movie, whatever it's called, start, has started production and I couldn't be more happier about it. This Spider-Man 3, I don't know what to think anymore. There's been so many rumours. If we don't get off the stuff that's been rumoured, everyone's going to be so disappointed with this movie, even if it's the greatest Spider-Man movie of all time. They're going to be saying, yeah, but this one wasn't on it. Or Tobey Maguire or Andrew Garfield. Anyway, there's so many rumours. I, I read one rumour that was actually DM to me personally because they know I'm a geek, a geek star. If you like, let's call me a geekster, right? And they know I do these videos and I'm on Twitter going on about geek all day. Now, they said something like Andrew Garfield and Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man will spend time together in Spider-Man 3. They, look, there's a list of things. I should have copied and pasted it, by the way, so I could have read the whole thing. But it's along those lines. Anyway, CBR.com are, are reporting Marvel is the aging Alfred Molina for Spider-Man No Way Home. Spider-Man No Way Home's Alfred Molina will be de-aged by CGI to again play Dr. Octopus, a role he last played 70 years ago in Spider-Man 2 by Jim Johnson. Wow, that's an easy name to read out. I I'm happy about that. It's been 17 years since Alfred Molina played Dr. Octopus in Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 2. So how will the filmmakers account for the age difference when Molina reprises his role in the upcoming Spider-Man No Way Home? Simple. His character will be de-aged by CGI, as he has been done previously with characters in other Marvel films. Molina spoke of how No Way Home director John Watts reminded him of those previous efforts. What? Molina's been talking about this? This is not just the rumour then. There's so much going on sometimes. Uh, if I'm going to do these videos properly, I'm really going to have to be on the ball here, right? Anyway, so this is what Molina said. He just looked at me and said, did you see what we did to Bob Downey Jr. and Sam Jackson? Melina told Variety, what was referenced 2016's Captain America Civil War when CGI technology was used to make Robert Downey Jr.'s Tony Stark appear younger in a flashback sequence. The same technology was used on Samuel L. Jackson's Nick Fury in 2019's Captain Marvel, which took place in the 90s. The aging via CGI has been used in other films. 
And while Molina admits the technology gets the look down, he points to Martin Scorsese's The Irishman as an example of its shortcomings. Yeah, terrible. I was in, I liked The Irishman as a film, but the CGI was horrible. They made Robert De Niro's face younger, Molina said, but when he was fighting, he looked like an older guy. He looked like an ang he looked like an old guy. That's what worried me about doing it again. I don't have the same ph um, psych psychality that I had. Sorry, I, I don't have the same physicality that I had 17 years ago. That's just a fact. In Spider-Man 2, Molina played, Molina played scientist turned supervillain Otto Octavius, who became Doc Ock after a laboratory accident grafted a set of four mechanical arms to his body. The artificial tentacles gave Ock his extraordinary powers, a notion Molina subsequently re recollected. I then remembered that it's the tentacles that do all the work, Molina added. He also acknowledged that while his mechanical arms handled all the action as an actor, he simply, he had to appear villainous with a mean look on my face. It was fantastic, Molina concluded. After endangering New York City with his untested fusion reaction in Spider-Man 2, Doc Ock's god side re-emerged as he sacrificed himself to ultimately destroy the reactor and save the city. So No Way Home is not only faced with the task of de-aging Otto Octavius, its script also has to bring him back to life in the first place. Yes, he died, didn't he? Or he went under the water. Maybe he didn't die. We'll find out. Directed by John Watts, Spider-Man No Way Home stars Tom Holland, Zendaya, Jacob Batalon, Marissa Tomei, Tony Revolveri, Jamie Foxx, Alfred Molina and Benedict Cumberbatch. The film arrives in theatres December 17th. So, I wasn't sure about this either. You see, I'm a crap YouTuber, aren't I? Let's, let's be honest. You're going to turn me off. You have permission to turn me off. I was never sure if this film was coming out this year because of all the delays and everything. But really exciting. What a year. What a fucking year for films we've got. This could be one of the best comic book movies we've ever seen. And the DC stand part of me, which is most of me, is, is no. But anyway, I'm excited for this movie. We are going to get Maguire. We are going to get Garfield. We're going to get a bunch of people from Raimi's movie. This is very exciting. The multiverse is happening in the MCU. The multiverse is happening in DC. And what's interesting to see is... Who's going to handle it the best? I'm really pumped for Spider-Man 3 now. I've convinced myself into it, haven't I? Anyway, a little bit from Heroic Hollywood here. Doc Ock's story in Spider-Man No Way Home will be picking up the exact moment where Spider-Man 2 left off. Let me fucking repeat that. Doc Ock's story in Spider-Man No Way Home will be picking up exact, the exact moment where Spider-Man 2 left off. Wow. wow, wow, that's sensational. So literally, we're going to see what happened to him when he went underwater. Literally, the Raimi universe is continuing. And one negative little fucker down here goes, nah, that movie is perfect. Bringing him back in that exact moment just ruins his redemption arc. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. He could be helping them. Maybe he's not a villain in the movie. We don't know. Anyway, thank you, Kevin Fake, for doing this. You are expanding this universe, bringing back a universe that we loved growing up. I love Spider-Man 3. Don't kill me, right? I like Green Lantern and I like Masters of the Universe and I like the Green Lantern movie. I'm sorry, but that's awesome and very exciting. 465 million budget on the Amazon Prime Lords of the Rings TV show that is set before the Lords of the Rings trilogy, written and directed by Peter Jackson. 465 million. Do you imagine how many fucking children you could feed with that? Can you imagine how many houses you could build? But we live in the world of capitalism and business. And although I think it's fucking despicable and immoral, I'm fucking excited about this. That's a big budget and people complaining, you know, blah, blah, blah. Oh, if you can do this, why can't you do that? Listen, they're a greedy company who want to make money and people complaining. Was it, Bolo no, I can't read it now, but was it that baloney journalist, not baloney, baloney, anyway, whatever his name is, that the Hollywood reporter, I think, is saying, you know, they're spending 465 million on an existing IP. Why don't they do something new? The problem is, Matthew, if you go down that, um, um, kind of um, logic, then you've got to have a go at Marvel, DC, everyone. 
everyone is just playing around with existing IPs because we are in an era of laziness, of creative bankruptcy. So this is why they're all investing so much money in these existing IPs, because they get butts in seats most of the time. Anyway, our final story for today is away from superheroes and movies and all of that. Well, kind of about someone who plays a superhero. But I told you my love about The Simpsons and Family Guy earlier. And this is some news from Variety, which really excited me. Watch Benedict Cumberbatch channel Morrissey this in this exclusive Simpsons clip. So I didn't know this, but the um, Benedict Cumberbatch, not the, but Benedict Cumberbatch will guest in this week's The Simpsons. At least I think it's this week. So very, very exciting. Looks like a great clip. Well, I won't play it here for copyright reasons. Stop me if you think you've heard this one before. Benedict Cumberbatch guest stars as a moody 80s era UK crooner who becomes Lisa's imaginary friend on this Sunday's episode of The Simpsons. I can't wait. Variety has a first look at this folksery as he gives his take on the citizens of Springfield. Scroll down to watch. In, in the episode Panic on the Streets of Springfield, Cumberbatch plays Quillaby. Described as Lisa's new imaginary friend, a depressed British singer from the 1980s. Also in the episode, Homer becomes a truck guy in the all helping write music for the episode, Flight of the Con Concords, uh, Brett McKenzie. Wow. Of course, it doesn't take much to realise Quillaby looks and sounds an act, uh, a noted moody vegan and lately controversial right winger, Morrissey. Oops, that's The Simpsons. Controversial. I grew up as a moody kid, obsessed with catchy yet depressing indie music from England. So this show was sort of a natural for me, said Tim Long, who wrote the episode. And like Marge, my parents wondered what the hell was wrong with me. They still don't know. Long clarifies that the character is not Morrissey, but an original character created for The Simpsons. Mm, I think you based him on Morrissey, didn't you? And I'm sticking by that, he quipped. Having said that, the character is definitely Morrissey-esque with maybe a small dash of Robert Smith from The Cure, Ian Curtis from Joy Division, and a bunch of other people. Uh, long I had a chance to see Morrissey and The Smiths in the summer of 86 on the band's Queen Is Dead tour, and it's safe to say they changed my life, he said. I've been Moz many times since then, most recently at the Hollywood Bowl in 2018. Executive producer Matt Selman was also at that show, and we got to talking about how much music meant to us uh, as, as, as weird, alienated teenagers and also how being a, a big fan of someone is like having a lifelong relationship with them. With all the ups and downs that implies, this show grew out of that discussion. Long raves about Cumberbatch in the role, along with the, his scenes with y y y sorry, so again, Yardley Smith, the voice of Lisa Simpson, are just magical and the songs with lyrics by me and music by Brett McKenzie are so good, he added. Brett knew exactly what we were going for and nailed it. He's maybe the nicest genius I know. In the screen grab above, eagle-eyed viewers will learn that Quillaby was originally the lead singer of the Snuffs, whose hits included How Late Is Then, What Difference Do I Make, and The, Hamburg the Hamburger Is Homicide. Here's a first look at Sunday's show. We're not going to do that because YouTube are very strict right now. They scan your videos now for copyright bits. They never used to do that. So I'm just going to, I used to have my trailers on, my DCEU and MCU trailers on, going on in mute, on silent in the background as I used to gob off, right? But I don't do that anymore. Anyway, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed today's Big Mouth Daily. I will be back tomorrow with even more Big Mouth Daily. So go and tweet me, follow me over at Twitter, at Movies TV Mad. Um, comment down below, like, share and subscribe and I will be back tomorrow with even more Big Mouth Daily. See you again soon. I hope you enjoyed the show. I certainly did.